could you please tell us, you know, for members of the audience who don't uh, know well yet, or they don't feel they, they are confident with their knowledge of it, what are the main differences between Catholicism and Protestants, Protestantism, <laughs> at least in a nat natural? The main I suppose it depends on your perspective. There are lots of differences. Uh, for example, Luther thought it was important that the Bible was read in the vernacular so that people could have an understanding of, of, of what was being taught uh, in the gospel. Or, or you could see it in perspective of power in that Protestants um, don't submit to the authority of the Pope, although some of them will recognize um, the leadership of, of Rome. So there are different, I mean, it's not as simple as saying this is what Protestantism course, yeah. is, this is what Catholicism yes. is. Um, but I would say in terms of Luther, uh, both of those issues play at hand, although he didn't obviously intend to leave the Roman Catholic Church initially. He ended up resorting in heresy. But a lot of it comes down to submission. Yeah. Would you say that one contention, and this is why Anglicanism, I think, in, particularly in England, not just the global Anglican Church, occupies a, a middle ground, is that a lot of Protestant sects place the locus of legitimate biblical interpretation in the individual focusing on their personal relationship with God, whereas the hierarchy of the Catholic Church is the, being the bridegroom of Christ, is that which interfaces on behalf of its flock. They do, do now, but that isn't how it began. I think that's a, that's a very modern interpretation because it's we live in a society of individualism, right? So everyone's like, oh, I don't need church. I've got my Bible. I can find Christ myself. It's like, yeah, but that's not Christianity because you need the church and you need to interpret the Bible through the church. I think even most Protestants of, of the Reformation would have agreed with that. I think the difference being that what, how we interpret the church is, is different now as well. So church, big C, is the body of Christ, um, you know, the, the invisible church and the visible church. But the, the thing that we become a member of in our baptism in water and the Holy Spirit, the thing that we um, subscribe to or, or see as a marriage between Christ and us. So that is how we would interpret it in the broader sense but then there are people that would interpret it as a literal institution who would say, you know, this is the institution of the church and either you're part of that or you're not. And then the question becomes, well, what does it mean to be saved? Do you have to be a member of the institution or do you have to be a member of the broader body? Um, so th there's too much going on. I think we need to narrow it down a bit to, yeah. to, to really get to something. I purposefully asked this question and I really like uh, the answer because very frequently when we are talking about isms, mm. mass movements, yeah. they are umbrella terms. Yeah. So it's very difficult to capsulize and capture their essence in a nutshell in a way that does historical justice yes. to them. And if I can just interrupt for a moment, just to say that Protestantism in general was never ever about creating a new church. Yeah. And that's obviously a misconception of modernity that people think, oh, they set up the Lutheran church, they set up the Anglican church and such. Protestantism or the Reformation was about reforming the church. It was about finding out error, heresy, superstition and ridding the church of them for the church yes. in order to protect Christ's body on earth and to, and to make it more accurate, uh, more, more wholesome and, and less uh, heretical. That was the purpose of it. It was never to separate and to create something new. That's that's currently what's happening at the moment a little bit as well, not to get into papal politics, but when Pope Francis befriends the widow of Paolo Freire and comes out and said that there's no migrant crisis, it's no shock that there is a split into the progressive Germans that are saying he's not adopting abortion fast enough or, yeah. or female bishops and priests yeah. and all that. And then the more traditionalists who I find affinity with who go, Vatican II was a mistake, only John Paul II has been the, and, and sometimes Pope Benedict as well, um, has been good and in line since, and it seems that the current Pope is rendering himself illegitimate by having his ears deaf to the Holy Spirit. So it's not surprising that that sentiment happened back then and is being reverberated now, yeah. when the person who is occupying that seat, who has those obligations bestowed upon him, is not living up to that vocation. So. Yeah. There's a question here, because to my mind, and I don't know a lot about this, and obviously uh, I think you're the person to answer. Would you say that in most brands of Catholicism, if not in everyone, there is the injunction to obey the Pope, because the Pope is the representative of God's will on earth, so or, or, not, or this is completely wrong? Again, that's another modern idea. Okay. So when I look at Catholicism, I look at the first 
uh, the undivided church of the first millennium, right? So I look at when, before the Great Schism, and look at when the whole church was as united as it has ever been, and try to look at what was taught then and what was known then, and what the church fathers taught and, and knew. And no one spoke of the Pope. I mean, first of all, he's not the Pope. The Pope is the, is the, is the title of the, uh, of the Eastern Orthodox head of the church. The, the Bishop of Rome, is the Pontifex, is not the Pope. It's, it's a colloquialism that we've adopted that doesn't really make much sense. But let's, let's go with it anyway. But the Pope was never the universal ruler of the church. Mm. Now, he sits in the seat of Peter, which is an honorific seat. It, it has a lot of prestige for obvious reasons. Um, but so did all the apostolic seats. Um, Constantinople, for one, and this is why the great shame of the, the Fourth Crusade when Constantinople was tipped, um, it does us all a de detriment. But all of those seats were honorific. The seat of Peter was seen as the first among equals. Now, that into Paris is in important because it was never a jurisdictional thing. It was never an earthly authority thing until Councillor Trent, Vatican I, Vatican II, like very, very recent. Um, for example... The king of France assigned bishops, bishoprics in France. The king of Spain assigned bishoprics in Spain. Uh, one of the reasons that Henry VIII fell out with the Bishop of Rome is because he was assigning bishoprics in England. And he, we said, well, you have no authority in this realm. And so it was an overstep of his jurisdiction, an overstep of his authority. Um, Eamon Duffy writes about this very well from a Catholic perspective on how the papacy has, has been a power grab. And it's not actually... The magisterium is the authority of the church, not the Pope. And this whole idea of, well, he's only infallible when he's speaking ex cathedra, uh, again, all a very contemporary conception. Speak to the church fathers, and none of them would have recognized that language or, or the idea, the very concept is foreign. So we, we've kind of, I think, to be honest with you, when the Holy Roman Empire, Empire fell, and the Pope no longer had his dominions, his armies, his territories, he lost a lot of earthly power. Yeah. And this was a political figure, a, a, essentially a, a monarch of sorts, a constitutional monarch. And so he regained some of that power by grabbing theological power, by grabbing church, church power. And this is one of the reasons that I, I'm not in full communion with Rome. Because okay. I recognise his position of, as, as, as a leadership position, as a first among equals, but I recognise him as just any other bishop. I don't see, an alter, al, I don't see a universal jurisdiction over all the bishops. So more like a primum inter pares, but yes. not as the infallible head Absolutely. of the institution. Yeah, yeah. and um, which, okay. which most Catholics most of the time would have agreed with. Mm. Yes, but this when did this change? Was there a change in scholarship that led people into adopting the more modern view? Was there a change in the rhetoric? What what contributed to this change of perspective? Um, I think, as with a lot of situations of power, you don't always um, legislate it, you gain it by practicing it. Yes. So once, once you've been assigning bishoprics for a, a few decades, it becomes, it becomes expected that you are the person that does it. And then that's, that's a literal power grab. Yes. And therefore, there's no way to challenge it because it's not actually, there's no written jurisdiction. Would you say so that, practice. Would you say that Luther challenged that or not? Yeah, yeah, he did challenge that amongst, amongst the many things that he challenged. But again, the, the fault there is not managing to correct or challenge whilst remaining within the church. There's no point stepping outside of yeah. the church and then challenging it from the outside because no one's going to listen, or not yeah. to the same degree. Okay. Also, in the inverse as well, two factors that influence in the 20th century. Uh, one, I'm not going to sit there and rag on Vatican II the entire time, <laughs> but the restructuring of the church, the decreased emphasis on the Latin Mass, the rewriting of various prayers, the mm. practical removal of incense and beauty mm. uh, with architecture you've already alluded to with, within the church made the Catholic Church a lot more Puritan, Protestant in practice. And okay. so it hollowed out the yeah. heart of it and it's a seat of a lot of discord. And this is something that Paul Kengel's documented. There was a, a communist activist by the name of Dr. Bella Dodd who led an infiltration effort into the Catholic Church. And this was two-pronged. Uh, there were the liberation theologists in South America that were emboldened by the Romanian spy chiefs over at the KGB. They cooked that up to try and subvert South America. Now we have Pope Francis, who is a liberation theologist Jesuit. They're at it again. And also Bella Dodd in the States led a lot of communist activists to enroll themselves in the church. And she estimated 
well over the hundreds. Um, and she told this to a congressional testimony, I believe. So having those kinds of people piddling inside your tent mm. means you're going to get a flood. Well, okay. it was the enemy. It was the enemy trying to infiltrate the church, mm. which is what he's always wanted to do. Mm. And too many people succumbed, unfortunately. You know, the traditional Latin mass is, is pretty much the fullness of the, of the mass. It's a great shame that it was, well, that it's currently being suppressed. It's, it seems to me that there is no good reason to suppress something that is true, good and beautiful, other than being influenced by the enemy. Yeah, it's a ratcheting effect up towards the human ego, the same sort of thing that compelled Eve to eat of the fruit and think that she could be as a god in everything must be comprehensible, everything must be available to the self-authoring sovereign subject. But that's just the excuse that's used for the delusion. Yeah. And, and the interesting thing for me as, as someone outside of communion with Rome is that we've managed to hold on to this. So the, the, the English church um, has managed to hold on to the mass in its fullness. So if you look at the English Missal, it is the, the Latin mass, but with words translated to English. So they didn't remove things as they did with the Novus Ordo. And the, the translation is much more beautiful. In fact, the Roman Catholic Church has come round to the translation of the English church for things like, um, you know, when, if I say the Lord be with you, what would you say? Um, and with the spirit. Right, which, which was changed from, yes. um, and also with you. Yes. But we've always said, and with thy spirit. For, so that's just one example of like, the English translation has always been superior because the, the Roman one was rushed mm. post-Reformation. Um, but if we'd have worked together, if we hadn't have split, it would have been far better for everyone. But my point is that we hung on to the mass. So the English mass, although Roman Catholics wouldn't recognise it as valid or legitimate for political reasons, because the Pope decided it was no longer valid or legitimate. But if take that aside for a moment and assume that the mass is the mass, the English mass is more reverential and higher than the Novus Ordo. I, I would say sometimes more reverential and higher in, in theology than the Latin mass, but it's oftentimes on a level with it because we didn't have the same um, theological uh, watering down dilution that happened during Vatican II. Mm. When it comes to Protestantism and the break from Catholicism, would you say that it is a sensible generalization to claim that Protestantism is much more decentralized in its operation than Catholicism? Uh, yeah. So I think what Weber is getting at in the beginning of the book is by saying that there is a, there is a spirit of decentralization in Protestantism yeah. that was also parallel to a, an effort to decentralize the economy. Right. And I, I was reading some books ago, some time ago, about the effect of the Black Plague mm. on, the, on Europe. And uh, lots, of, uh, lots of them were saying that uh, around a third of the European population died because the economic model was production for immediate consumption. And that led to the absence of a stock. So there was a decentralized economic mm. activity or there was a pressure to decentralize economic activity after that. Yeah. And Weber would, would say that these tendencies, in combination with Protestantism, which was much more decentralized in yeah. exercising power in comparison to... It's the greatest weakness of Protestantism. So okay. whilst we just talked about liturgical reforms and how the, yeah. the, the English church has been saved of those because of this decentralization, it's yeah. also the greatest weakness of Protestantism okay. because there is no authority, there's no direct authority. They don't have anywhere to look for mm. authority, which should mean that nothing changes. But in effect, yeah. it means that things become more and more liberal because there's no one to stop it. If we look at, for example, the ordination of women or the remarriage of remarrying of divorcees or the acceptance of contraception, look at any kind of liberalism that's taken hold in the in the Anglican Church as an example. It's because there is no ultimate authority, there is no authority to look to. So that mm -hmm. should mean that the church has no authority to make these decisions. But in yeah. fact, what it's meant in practice is the church has no authority to prevent them. Yeah. To watch the full video, please become a premium member at lotuseaters.com.